All right, if you have your Bibles, join me in Matthew chapter number 2. Last week we looked at the wise men search for Jesus. Uh, we saw that they were instructed by King Herod to bring word when they found him so that he could come and worship him as well. Uh, we're calling this part of the miniseries, which we'll finish up this morning, Christmas in July, because that's what we're talking about is the birth of Christ. But we also saw last week that uh, he wanted to come and worship him, but we saw what was really behind that. He saw Jesus, this new king, as a threat to his throne, so he didn't want to worship him. He wanted to know where he was so that he could kill him. Well, we left off last week by the wise men being instructed by God to go home another way. Don't go back and tell Herod. Go home a different way. Uh, and we saw that they chose to obey God rather than, rather than obey man. Uh, and that's where we're going to pick up this morning. Okay? Uh, Matthew, very quickly, I told you from the beginning, he doesn't go into a lot of details about the birth of Christ. Doesn't go into a lot of details about the, all of this information. He's simply uh, just jumping from step to step trying to prove uh, that this is the Messiah, the one that they had waited for. But after we see that, we're going to see this flight to Egypt, all right? Uh, he sent the wise men on a different way, but Jesus was still in danger. And so we see that uh, as we look at the warning here given. In verse number 13, it says, Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. So once the wise men left, an angel of the Lord appears to Joseph uh, with a warning and some instructions. Uh, we can see the urgency here because this happens right after the wise men left. And we see things from an outside looking in, but, but I want you to do the math here. Herod had instructed the wise men to report to him after they found Jesus and tell him where they were. Well, we know the pretense that he was doing that so that he might worship him, but we also know the real reason that he wanted to do that was that he might kill him. Uh, and so the wise men were warned by God not to return to Herod, as we saw last week, but to go home another way. Well, how long do you think it would take before Herod realized that these wise men weren't coming back? How long do you think it would take before he realized, wait a minute, they're not coming to tell me where he has been born? Uh, and so once that information would get to him, he would, he's, he's dead set on getting rid of this king, so he would send somebody else to kill baby Jesus, to kill this king, to, to remove the threat to the throne, all right? And so that was the idea here, uh, and the angel says, because he's going to send somebody else, we need to get you out of Bethlehem. And so the angel tells uh, Joseph, take Jesus and Mary to Egypt and stay there until everything is okay, all right? Well, then we see the obedience in verse 14. It says, um, and... <coughs> Excuse me. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt. I told you last week that we don't know a whole lot about Joseph. But what we do need, that what we do know and all that we need to know, we find here in these two chapters. And one of the things that stand out first to me, and I shared it with you last week, is Joseph's obedience. Joseph was one that was willing to hear from God and then do what God told him to do. Uh, he look, we see here that quick obedience. The angel said, rise up and go. And the very next verse tells us he rose up and went. Now, how many of you can say you're that obedient to God? How many are like myself and sometimes you like to argue with God? God tells you what to do, and you've got a, a different plan, right? You've, you've got another idea on how it could be done better. How often we forget that God's in control of all things. If God said do it, it'd be easier just to do it. How many have ever tried to do it your way, and then you have to go back and do it God's way anyway? It reminds me of men following instructions. And I can pick on this because I are one. You, you open up box, it's got all these panels... You know, any, any furniture you get now, and you know, unless you go spend, but it comes in a box. You know, it, it's a piece of furniture. It takes up your living room, and it comes in a box this big, you know. 
and you get these instructions, but we're men. Wood attaches to wood. That, that, that's all we need to know. We don't need instructions, right? How many have found yourself after getting there that you go back and need instructions? How many of you find out after you put it together you got pieces left? I used to tell my mom all the time, Mama, everything's got extra pieces. Me, me and a, a friend of mine in, in high school blew the head gasket on my Honda. And, uh, they wanted so much money to replace it, it wasn't worth putting the money in. Well, he knew cars, and, and I you know, knew how to let him know cars. Uh, and so we took a bed sheet, and we put it out on the ground, and we took that thing apart, man. We took it apart, got all this apart, took the head, got it reserviced, put it all back together, got everything together, had one bolt left. My mom said, where's this bolt go? I don't know, Mom, everything's got extra parts. <laughs> I got fortunate. All it went to was the cover of the, the belt went in the bottom, and so I got fortunate. It wasn't a very important part, but I did. I stuck it in the ashtray. And I drove around that thing in the ashtray for months, rattling around until finally one day I was out there working on the car, and I said, oh, there's a hole that's supposed to have a bolt in it. I went to the ashtray, pulled the bolt out. So there it went, right there, see? We don't like to follow instructions, but one thing we see about Joseph, if God said do it, he did it. Uh, by the way, why Egypt? He's sending them down to Egypt, and, and we know if you've studied the Bible, if you've studied the Word of God, Egypt is always considered the world. So why would he be sending Jesus to the world? Why would he be sending them down to Egypt? Well, quite honestly with you, because it's out of Herod's jurisdiction. Herod has no jurisdiction in Egypt. And so if you want to be safe, go where Herod has no jurisdiction. Amen? Amen. And so that's where he's going. And by the way, there was a large population of Jews that would have been in Egypt. So he would be able to go down there, the family would be able to go down there, and they'd be able to fit right in. And I'll tell you one more reason, but you'll have to wait for just a moment. All right, so we see the order, the obedience, and then we see the outcome in verse 15. It says, and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Out of Egypt I called my son. We see two things accomplished here. Number one, it kept Jesus safe from Herod. Now, admittedly, God is God. God could have kept Jesus safe anywhere he wanted to. Amen? All right, God could have put his hands around him, and you're not going to touch him. I don't care if he's sitting right in front of you. If God says you're not going to touch him, you're not going to touch him. Most of us forget that God has control over all things. Most people know my, my warning. How many like to worry? How many do worry? And when you bring that worry to me, what am I going to tell you? Try not to worry until there's something to worry about. And then when there's something to worry about, try not to worry. Think about how much worry robs us of. Because most of the things we worry about never happen. Amen? I mean, I'll have it. We, uh, coming home, uh, I think about a week or so ago, I'm coming home and I see this big old cloud of smoke over this direction. I said, oh boy, my house is on fire. <laughs> like all the places over here, it's my house, right? Well, that come on down and somebody down the road's burning leaves or something, you know, doing something else. But, but that, that's how our mind works. We, we tend to jump to the worst scenario right off the bat. But God's in control. But the second thing that we see here in this outcome is it fulfilled prophecy. Why was Jesus in Egypt? Because God said out of Egypt his son would come. Uh, in Hosea chapter 11, verse 1, it says, When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. Just as Israel as a nation came out of Egypt, so would the Son of God. Hosea was uh, foreshadowing what was to come. Uh, and here we see it fulfilled. Again, remember I told you Matthew is trying to prove to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. I told you he would quote more Old Testament prophecy than any other writer. So we see here right off the bat, him going down to Egypt and coming out of Egypt was a fulfillment of prophecy. Well, we see this as followed by a time of wickedness. 
in verse 16 through 18, first of all, the finding, then Herod, uh, at the beginning there of of verse 16, it says, and when Herod saw he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious. Now, interesting word choice here. The King James says he was mocked. The uh, ESV says he was been tricked. The Christian Standard Bible says he was outwitted. The New King James says he was deceived. I don't think any of those translations capture what had happened here. All right, all of those are kind of misleading because they make it sound like this was something the wise men planned to do on purpose, that they planned to mislead Herod, that they planned to trick Herod. They weren't planning on tricking Herod. They weren't planning on misleading Herod. They weren't planning on mocking Herod. They were planning on doing what God told them to do. Amen? Now, the result of Herod, that was none of their business. God said, don't go back and tell them, so they didn't go back and tell them. I don't think there was any plan. I think the plan was, let's obey God. Amen? Now, how many know sometimes obeying God makes somebody else look like a fool? That was just a result of obeying God. Okay? And so they weren't trying to trick him. All that being said, Herod does realize the wise men, they're not coming back. There is no report coming. There is no one coming to tell him where to find this this baby. Now, I don't know how long that took, but at this point he figures that out. And then we see, how many uh, get a little angry when things don't go your way? I bet you don't get this angry. Look at the rest of verse 16. He became furious, and he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had asserted from the wise men. This discovery that the wise men were not coming back, all right, now understand we're building here. He's upset, number one, because there's a king that's born. And that king is going to threaten his throne, right? So he's already upset. How many know when you're upset, it doesn't take more to get you more upset? Now, the people that he said, hey, go find him and bring me back word where he is, now they don't come back. So now he's mad, mad, right? Uh, And so he tells them, as he discovers this, that he is ordered to go and to, to kill all the male children in the region two years and under. Now, if you're using a King James, you're going to find that that is only the one of, one of very few translations, I should say, that leave out the fact that it was male children. It just says children. However, it's implied in the original Greek, the word pehasi, which means boy, son, or young man. And also, it's kind of implied that if he's going on the throne, it's going to be a male, okay? And so it's just assumed there, that's what we're talking about. And so this is why Herod says that we're going to kill all the male children. I've heard people uh, read that and say, God killed all the children, male or female, just wiped them all out. No, he didn't. (laughs) The target was those that were going to be a threat to the throne. And at that time and age, the only threat to the throne were males. And so all the male children, two and under, he ordered to have them slain. This order was probably given secretly. And it was given to cast a net to ensure the age range of this new king's birth. You must account for when did the star first appear? Remember, he asked the wise men that when they came. And then we've got to to account for the time it took all the wise men to gather together. I didn't go into this when we did it, but by the way, there were more than three wise men. Amen? We always say three wise men because they brought three gifts. We think that uh, some people say there could have been hundreds of them. Uh, And so they're going on this march, they're going on this hunt to find the Messiah. And so I imagine it happened like this. Word gets out, we're meeting here, and then we're going. So as they're waiting for all of the wise men to gather together, because guess what? All the wise men didn't live in one little town. All right, so they've got to wait for all of them to gather together, and then after they all gather together, then they'll go hunt for this baby following the star. 
Then we have to add to that how long Herod waited to receive word back that he didn't receive. Okay? Uh, you do know, contrary to the nativity that, that you're going to set up in December, you do know the wise men did not arrive at the stable, right? Okay? Uh, they came a little bit of time after that because he was in a home by the time they arrived. So anyway, you put all those together, you do the math, all the calculations, and Herod figures, okay, it's sometime within the last two years. So to make sure we get every child or make sure that we, that we get the king, we're going to kill all of the male children two years and under. But then we see the fulfillment in verses 17 and 18. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice shall, uh, was heard in Ramah weeping uh, in loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because, they're, because they are no more. Here we come to another interesting bit of information. It says, then was fulfilled. So we see through these events that another Old Testament prophecy has been fulfilled. And it's referring back to Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 15, that says, A voice is heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rachel is weeping for her children. She refuses to be comforted for her children because they are no more. Here, Rachel is the representation of Bethlehem's mothers. The prophecy was literally fulfilled when Judah was carried into captivity, leading to a great mourning of the tribes of Benjamin and Judah and the slaying of their children. But it also is applied here to the murder of innocent children in Bethlehem and the region around because of Herod's, son, uh, Herod's uh, search for um, this new king. So just in this story, we're sitting at how many prophecies? Two. Okay? Pay attention to that. This was done so that this might be fulfilled. Church, if God said it, that settles it. You take it to the bank, it's going to happen. Well, then we see the withdrawal here in verses 19 through 23. First of all, we see another dream in verse 19. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead. So after Herod died, the angel once again appears to Joseph in a dream. With these instructions, it's time to go home. Rise up, take the child and his mother, and go back to Israel. Now there's some debate on how long they actually spent in Egypt. And some of your Bible theologians and scholars, they like to argue about this. But can I tell you something? Does it matter? Does it matter how long they were in Egypt? Okay, we are not recorded in the scriptures. There are no important events that happened in the life of Jesus while he was in Egypt. So it really doesn't matter why he was there. Okay, or, or, or doesn't matter how long he was there. We see that he is now being instructed uh, to pull him out. And then we see the departure in verse 21. It says, and he arose and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. Once again, we see Joseph's quick response and quick obedience. God said it. Joseph did it. That settled it. But I do want you to notice something here. I don't know if you've paid attention. Have you been paying attention to this dream and every time the angel speaks to Joseph? He's always talking about two individuals. They're who? The baby and the mother. Anybody paid attention to how they're listed? If we were talking about them, we would probably say what? The mother and the baby. He doesn't say that at all, does he? Notice every time he says the child and his mother. Listen to me very carefully. God is putting preeminence on the child. Now, I'm not saying Mary's not important. What I'm saying is Jesus is more important. <laughs> Amen? There's a whole section of people out there, I'll just leave it at that right now, that want to worship Mary. 
No, Mary's not the one to be worshipped. Jesus is the one to be worshipped. Even from the very beginning, when God speaks of Mary and Jesus, He puts Jesus first. He is preeminent. Joseph may have had to take his family down to Egypt for a while, but it, they belonged in Israel, and now God is saying it is time to bring them back. However, we do see a little detour here in verses 22 and 23. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judah in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee, and he went and lived in a city called Nazareth, so that it was spoken, so what so what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled, that he would be called a Nazarene. On his journey home, Joseph discovers that Archelaus has now taken the throne of his father. Folks, if you think Herod was bad, he was nothing compared to his son. His son was wicked. And Joseph, rightfully so, was afraid to go. He was so wicked and incompetent and violent, so much so that the Jews pleaded with the Romans to have him removed. And finally, the Romans actually removed him from office in AD 6 because of his wickedness. But notice, I didn't say he wouldn't go. I said he, he was afraid to go. You know, there's a difference between af being afraid and not doing it. Folks, we can still step out for God when we're afraid because we serve the God of the fear not. Amen? So we just got to take that next step and trust that God's going to lead us through that. And he does, by the way. You see, he wouldn't have to go because in another dream, the angel appeared to Joseph telling him to go into the district of Galilee. So he's back in Israel, but in a different area. Uh, again, we see Joseph's obedience as he would settle his family in the city called Nazareth. Oh, and by the way, that just happened to fulfill another prophecy <laughs> spoken by the prophets. Now, let me go ahead and help you out here if you're looking for it. There is no Old Testament passage that says he will be called a Nazarene. You won't find it. It's not there. Some assume it is a reference to Isaiah 53.3 that says he will be despised and rejected by men. Nazareth was a place that was despised and rejected by men. Uh, in fact, in, uh, when uh, Nathaniel was told about Jesus over in John chapter 1, verse 36, if you'll remember, he says, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Warren Wiersbe has an interesting thought on this. He says, the word Nazarene may relate to the Hebrew word uh, netzer, which means branch, also another name for Jesus. This is why Matthew wrote prophets, plural. Since Jesus is called the branch in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1, and Isaiah chapter 4, verse 2, also in Jeremiah verse 23, or chapter 23, verse 5, Jeremiah 13, uh, verse 15 and Zechariah chapter 3 verse 8 and Zechariah chapter 6 verse 12. So many prophets were calling him this. Okay? Because he lived in a despised place, Jesus was a lowly branch, but a branch that would one day blossom into beauty and great glory. He said, well, preacher, where do you stand? I don't have to find it. Matthew, which God approved to the word of God, said that this was foretold by the prophet. So guess what? Settled it for me. It's foretold by the prophets. I don't need to know who said it, when they said it, how they said it. As long as God said they said it, that settled it. So we see in just this chapter, we see three different prophecies fulfilled about this Messiah. Now, by the way, Matthew is about to hit the fast forward button. All right. Now, for those of you that have never used a cassette tape or VCR or whatever, you might not know what fast forward means. He's about to go forward a lot, okay? <laughs> He's going to take us all the way to the time of John the Baptist. 
But before we hit that time warp, I do not want you to miss what we see here this morning. God chose to include this here for a reason, and I think we need to understand what the reason was. Number one, again, remember Matthew is writing to the Jews to prove that Jesus is the Messiah that they were looking for. He's already dealt with the prerequisites of the lineage. He's already dealt with the virgin birth. Last time we saw the wise men seeking him because they saw a star. This set into motion what we see this morning. Matthew pulls our attention into the stage of Jesus' childhood because once again we see him fulfilling the prophecies that were told about him by the Jews. So the evidence is mounting up. Matthew already, he's in chapter number 2, and he's already given enough evidence to say, yes, Jesus is the Messiah. By the way, do you think he's finished? No. He's going to keep on. So by the time the Jews finish reading Matthew's letter, there would be no doubt in anybody's mind that this is the Messiah. The only way to deny that this is the Messiah is to reject the truth that has been presented. And how many know that people will do that? There are people today that will argue with you about anything. You can have all the proof in the world, and, and they're still going to argue with you because they didn't think it should have happened that way or did happen that way, so they're just going to argue about it. Matthew's leaving no doubt. This is the Messiah. Church, we too have the evidence of God's Word and the fulfillment of prophecy. The question we need to ask ourselves is, have we accepted it? Do you believe that he's coming again? Do you believe that he's coming for his church? Do you believe that he's going to take us home to be with him for eternity in heaven? Those that have put their trust and their faith in him. Do you believe that? That's been prophesied. That's been told. We are told that's going to happen. That's the next big event on God's timeline. Do you believe it? I'm looking around. I, I don't think you believe it. Either you don't believe it or you're asleep. Do I need to fire the cannons? Let me try this again. Do you believe it? Now let me do the part that you were afraid of and why you didn't vocalize a minute ago. Are you living like you believe it? Because if you're not living like you believe it, then you don't believe it. Amen? If I told this side of the church, boy, if I had this set up, this would be beautiful right now. If I told this side of the church, this cannon right here is about to shoot this way. Anybody moving? Only if you believe me, right? If you believe me, you're going over there. If you don't believe me, you're going to get sit here and it's... I'm just kidding. I don't have the ability to shoot it. Wish I did. You see, if we believe it, it'll lead to an action. If we believe that Jesus was coming back and he could come back at any time, guess what? We'd do something about it. We'd get our life where it needed to be, and we'd find other people and help them get their life where it needs to be. Where does your relationship with Jesus stand? What kind of influence do you have on the lives of those around you? Number two, I think that we once again here in chapter number two, we see that challenge of obedience. I love this chapter. The angel said it. Joseph did it. Simple obedience. That's the way it ought to be. He said, but preacher, I don't have an angel telling me what to do. No, sir. If you're a believer, you got something a whole lot better than the angel. You have the Holy Spirit living within you. And as you read God's Word and as you pray, the Holy Spirit will lead you and guide you and direct you every single day. The question is, are you following Him? Are you following that lead? Are you trusting Him? Are you living in obedience? You don't need an angel to tell you what to do. The Word of God tells you what to do. And half of you ain't doing that now. It's kind of like all the way back when... You know, Jesus is given that parable, which, by the way, I don't think is a parable. 
because if it is a parable, it's the only one that mentions people by name. But the rich man and Lazarus, and, and you remember Lazarus, he's dead. He said, well, well, well go and send him and, and do, uh, to, to, I mean, the rich man, he goes and says, go and send him to, to warn my family that this place is real, <laughs> this place of hell. And you remember what he was told? They have the prophets. If they won't believe them, then how are they going to believe someone that comes from the dead and tells them? In other words, the prophets stand for the word of God. They have the word of God. Folks, we have the word of God. We don't need anything else. We have the word of God. If we're not living by that, an angel coming and sitting on your shoulder ain't going to convince you of nothing. <laughs> Read it. Get in the word of God. Learn it, love it, live it. And then the other thing that we see here is plans change. Our plans are not always God's plans. As we introduce this whole thing, this isn't how Joseph thought things were going to happen. <laughs> but this is how they happened. Guess what? God doesn't always do everything the way we want it to happen. The question is, are you still willing to follow? Are you still willing to obey? God's path is not always an easy path. Are you still willing to follow? Are you still willing to walk? And are you still willing to obey it? It may require you to uproot and, and step out of your comfort zone. Are you still willing to go? Too many people are living this life, God, I'll do anything for you as long as it fits in this box. Kind of like the postal service. If it fits, it ships. You can put anything in that box you want to. God, you can put anything in this box you want to as long as I don't have to step outside of this box. Well, guess what? Sometimes God wants us to step outside the box. Amen? Sometimes God wants us to do something that, that might test our comfort zone. Sometimes God wants us to do something that, that might not be comfortable for us. Are you still willing to, are you still willing to obey Him? Yes, we're seeing the early days of Jesus, but we're also seeing some good godly examples of people being used of God to accomplish His will simply because they would obey. Mary, the mother of Jesus, why? Because she would obey. Joseph, the earthly father of Jesus, why? Because he was willing to obey. The wise men did not lead Herod to Jesus. Why? Because they were willing to obey. Joseph takes his family down to Egypt to run from Herod. Why? Because he was willing to obey. He brings his children or his family back out of Egypt up to, to Galilee. Uh, why? Because he's willing to obey. And by the way, if Nazareth was such a town that everybody says, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? How many of you are shopping for a home there? But God said, go there. And that's where they went. Church, if you don't learn anything else this morning, learn this. Trust. Obey. Why? As the song says, because there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. God may be working with you right now. God may be trying to get you to step out of your comfort zone to do something for him right now. Are you going to trust him? Are you going to do it? We've asked you for weeks to hand out invitations to our kid fest. And, and I know some of you say, well, I, I just don't like to talk to people. Well, guess what? You're going to have to step out of your comfort zone. How many think kids need the Lord? How many realize that they're at the age, the age of the kids that we're inviting, that is the critical age in getting people to follow Christ? How many realize we can have a difference in that? We've got to obey. That, that neighbor that God's been trying to lead you to, to invite to church or to talk to about church or to talk to about God, guess what? You might have to step out of your comfort zone. But are you going to listen to Him? Are you going to obey Him? 
We'd all serve him if it was easy, amen? But sometimes it's not easy. But we still got to trust him and obey him. Whatever it is that God's working in you, will you come and bring it here this morning? Say, God, I'm going to trust you and I'm going to follow you. I'm going to obey you. Maybe you're here this morning and you say, oh, everything's all right. Just God ain't really doing nothing with me. Well, I'm, I got news for you. I shared this yesterday. If your testimony to God is only what he's done in the past and not what he's doing today, it's time for you to get revived. Because God's doing new things every day for those that will follow him and want to be a part of his plan. So maybe you need to do that. Maybe you realize this morning you've gotten too comfortable and you need to come and say, God, I I'm ready. Take me out of my comfort zone and I'll follow you. Will you do that? Will you trust him? Will you obey him? Father, we love you. We thank you, Lord, for this example of godly obedience that we've seen in the life of Joseph. Lord, a, a man taking care of his family but doing it, Lord, as he obeys you. Doing it as he trusts you to lead the way and lead the steps. Father, we can do anything as long as we're doing it in your will and we're doing it your way. So help us, Lord, to trust you. Lord, maybe we have, Lord, some family situations here this morning that need to be shored back up. Lord, as husbands and wives commit themselves to you to trust you and obey you and, Lord, to follow you in, in their family. Maybe we have some people, Lord, that have been putting off reaching others with the gospel because they're, Lord, just afraid to knock that door, afraid to, to pick up the phone, afraid to, to talk to somebody. Lord, will they trust you that, Lord, you'll give them the words to say and the courage that's needed, help them to obey you. Whatever it may be that we're struggling with, Father, help us to turn it over to you and to trust you with it, in it, and through it to draw us closer to where you want us to be and to accomplish the will that you have for our lives. We'll praise you for it in Christ's name.